Good morning and welcome to our Easter Sunday service here online at Dornoch Free Church. It's a real privilege to be able to worship together with you this morning. Uh, this week, our evening service is at 6 p.m. and that will be on Zoom. Um, and again, we will be looking at a passage about the good news and why it is such good news that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, if you would like details of how to join us, please just get in touch with us through the website dornochfreechurch.co.uk or through our Facebook page and we will share the details with you. We don't have any uh, Bible study groups um, or Bible reading group this week because of the holidays, but we do have the midweek prayer meeting and Bible study on Wednesday at 7.30 and that is also on Zoom. So just get in touch and we can share those details with you. For the next two Sundays at our in-person services, we are going to have a collection for the Women for Mission project. If you would like to find out more details about that, um, you can find uh, the details on the website listed below. And uh, if you would like to contribute uh, to that collection, either uh, again, get in touch through the website or uh, through Facebook, or I think you can also do that through the website um, for Women for Mission directly. As we gather together uh, to worship this morning, let's now hear our call to worship from Psalm 30, where it says, I will extol you for you have rescued me. You refused to let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you restored my health. You brought me up from the grave, O Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Let's worship our God together now as we sing. Say 
Let's pray together. Lord, as we gather together and worship this morning, once again, we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. And Lord, although we do that every Sunday morning as we gather, we do it especially uh, today on this Easter Sunday. We remember how our Savior suffered and died on the cross for us, how he was willing to lay down his life in order that we might become children of God. And Lord, that he defeated the enemy death and that on the third day he rose again. Lord, we thank you and praise you for our Savior Jesus. And as we uh, gather and worship this morning, Lord, we pray that you would be with our brothers and sisters wherever they are around the world. That as they too gather and remember our Savior Jesus, that they too would be encouraged and strengthened in him. That as we meet, we would see our Savior and we would know afresh the hope and the joy and the peace that comes through him. And Lord, we pray that especially for our brothers and sisters who today are being persecuted for their faith in you. We ask, Lord, that you would be with them and comfort them, that you would give them a boldness of faith, that as they suffer, that they would speak for you, and that those who um, are persecuting them and hurting them would see Christ in them, and that those that persecute them would see their need for our Savior, and that they too would put their faith in him. So that, Lord, one day the persecutor and the persecuted might stand side by side as brothers and sisters in Christ and worship him together. Lord, we pray that you would give us that boldness of faith also, that you would help us to speak of our Savior and to share the good news with others. Lord, we pray that you would bless us as a community of believers here in Dornach. And Lord, that now that we are able to at least in part start to meet together in person, that you would unite us in Christ, whether we are here in the building or whether we are at home. That we would remember that we are brothers and sisters uh, in him and that we would serve him joyfully together. And that we would serve one another out of a love for our Savior Jesus. And this morning, Lord, we pray especially um, for two of our sister congregations. We think of Golsby Free Church, and we ask that you would be with them this morning. Lord, that you would continue to bless the work there, that you would bless Eric and his ministry and the rest of the team. Lord, that uh, they would continue to grow as disciples of Jesus and that they would be a strong light for you in that community. We thank you for the relationships that they have fostered over the years and for the strong bond that there is between the congregation and many in the community. And we pray that you would help them um, to be salt and light for you, that others would be drawn into your kingdom. And we pray the same for our brothers and sisters in Bon Accord Free Church in Aberdeen. Lord, you know that uh, they are without a minister at the moment and we pray that you would guide them and strengthen them as they uh, look to you uh, and as they seek out the person to lead the ministry there. Lord, we ask that you would be with the rest of the leadership in that congregation, that you would help them to remain united and encouraged and motivated, that they would not become discouraged uh, throughout this vacancy, Lord, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But Lord, that they would find ways to creatively share your good news with the community around them. And Lord, as we pray this for our brothers and sisters, we also pray it uh, for the wider church, for the church throughout Scotland, for our denomination. Lord, we pray that you would help us to spread your good news. Lord, that we would um, be faithful to you. And that as we face pressures and threats, as we're going to discover this morning in our scripture reading, that as we face these things, 
that we would not deny you, but that we would boldly um, be uh, declaring that we are your disciples and that we would boldly share that good news. Lord, that we would delight in our Savior Jesus, that we would remember that he has risen from the dead and that even now um, he is at the right hand of the Father and that he intercedes and prays for us on our behalf and that through his Holy Spirit we are strengthened and equipped and guided and we pray that you would use us now as instruments in your hand. We pray that you would meet with us as we worship and that this morning we would uh, see afresh our need of him and what a beautiful Savior he is, and that each one of us uh, would have our faith firmly placed in him, whether it is for the first time this morning or whether we have been trusting him and following him for decades. Lord, help us and draw us close to our Savior. In his name, amen. Well, this morning we are gathered to celebrate Easter, to celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. But maybe for some listening to this, it doesn't seem like such good news. Either it seems irrelevant to us, or possibly we feel that the mistakes that we have made, the failures in our life, have separated us from God and have put us beyond the reach of redemption, beyond the reach of rescue. Some of us possibly in the past have said that we were Christians, we've put our faith in Jesus, but we feel so distant distant from him now that we wonder whether it really is good news for us. Surely our mistakes have separated us from him and we have burnt our bridges. But I hope if that is the case for you, that this morning, as we turn to our reading together, that you will find great hope. This morning, I want us to look at the life of Peter and particularly one moment in his life and see how uh, Jesus dealt with his failure. But before we can do that, we need to find the backstory. We need to see how this all played out. And the story actually starts three years before that first Easter. It starts on the shore of Galilee and Jesus is there preaching, preaching to a crowd early in the morning and fishing boats are coming in after fishing all night and the crowd is so big that Jesus is getting pushed closer and closer to the water and eventually he signals to one of the boats and asks if he can climb in and he preaches and teaches to the people from the boat. As Jesus finishes preaching and as the crowds begin to disperse, he turns to the men in the boat and he says, let's push the boat back out to sea and cast the net for some fish. And the guys in the boat say, Master, we have been fishing all night and we caught nothing. But if you really want to, we will. They go out They cast the net and the net fills with fish to the point of bursting. The guys are excited and just so amazed at what is happening. And they call to their friend in another boat and they say, come on guys over here and help us. And the two boats come and they start filling the boats with fish to try and stop the nets bursting. And there's so many fish that the boats begin to sink and they finally get them to shore And Peter, whose boat it is that Jesus is in, he falls at Jesus' knees and says, go away from me, I I am a sinner. I am not worthy. As he sees this miracle happening, he realizes that he is in the presence of somebody amazing. And he is aware of his own shortcomings and his own sins and failings. But Jesus says to him and to the guys in the other boat, um, brothers to John and his brother, and Jesus says to these guys, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what we see happening there is this relationship beginning to be forged and these guys start following Jesus and become some of his closest disciples for the next three years. 
They are growing in their relationship with Jesus. They're growing in their confidence in him. They're preaching for him. They're doing miracles for him. They are growing in their relationship with Jesus. But the night before Jesus' death, they have a conversation and everything changes. In that moment, Jesus tells them that he is going to die and that he is going to rise again. He tells them that the shepherd is going to be struck and the sheep are going to be scattered. In other words, he is going to be struck down and his disciples are going to scatter. And Peter says, no way, Lord. The others may desert you, but I will never desert you. I will follow you to the point of death. And Jesus warns him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the night is out. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. But the truth is the disciples didn't really get it. Jesus was arrested later that night. The disciples scattered. And although Peter had been boasting that he would follow Jesus, he becomes scared. He starts following at a distance. And then finally, he is in um, the court of the high priest outside his house. And Jesus has been tried there. And Peter doesn't even want to go and stand near him. And three times, Jesus, uh, Peter denies knowing Jesus as he stands next to this charcoal fire. And even a little girl asks him, hey, man, aren't you a disciple of Jesus? And Peter swears and says, man, I don't even know the guy. And in that moment, the rooster crows and Jesus turns and looks at Peter and their eyes connect. And Peter is stricken with guilt and the weight of shame and the fact that he wasn't able to keep his promise and he just denied his best friend. He runs out of the courtyard and bursts into tears. He has blown it. He has failed. The next morning, Jesus is nailed to a cross and crucified. He's buried in a grave in a cave and the disciples don't know what to do they are distraught they are hidden in an upper room but come Sunday morning some of the women go to find uh, the grave and to put some um, to, to dress the body to put herbs and spices on the body and as they come to the tomb, the stone is rolled away and there's an angel there and they discover that the Savior has risen, that Jesus is alive. They go and tell Peter and Peter and John come running to the tomb to see it for themselves. And they get there and they see that the body is gone and the grave clothes are there. They start trying to put the pieces together wondering where their Savior is. Has he really risen from the dead? And I'm sure in the back of Peter's mind, his denial of Jesus is echoing. Later that day, when they are in the upper room, Jesus appears to the disciples. And they are get just in shock they think it's a ghost but then they realize no this really is Jesus raised from the dead and he shares food with them he eats some fish that they have eight days later he appears to them again and this time Thomas who wasn't there joins them and he also sees Jesus and he's able to put his finger in the wounds on Jesus hand and to see the cut in Jesus side but Peter's relationship is not yet restored. Peter is there, but he's not really mentioned in the conversation. And I'm sure the weight of what he has done is crushing him in his heart and in his head. And now we find ourselves in John chapter 21. And I want to read a few verses here together and then look at how this relationship between Peter, the failed disciple, and Jesus, the risen Savior, unfolds. It says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. 
that is the Sea of Galilee. And he uh, revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were all together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we will go with you. They went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast the net and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment because he had stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. And when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and he hauled the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying these things, he said to him, follow me. Well, what I want us to do this morning is look at this passage. We've seen already that Peter failed as a disciple. He had denied Jesus three times. And as we began our reading here, we see that the reason that uh, John has included this in his gospel is he wants to show us how Jesus revealed himself to the disciples and how Jesus restored Peter. And what we find that as we open the chapter here that Peter um, has, and the other disciples have made the 150 kilometer journey from Jerusalem where Jesus had been crucified and where they had had that last supper with him. They've made the 150 kilometer uh, journey north back up to their home, back to the Sea of Galilee. Peter has failed as a disciple, but he is hungry and they are in need and he goes back to doing the one thing that he knows he can do. He goes back to fishing. 
And we don't know if uh, sometimes some commentators have said that this is him just giving up on Jesus altogether and going back to his old life. And I'm not too sure if that's really here in the passage or if it's just that these are poor men who need to eat and they are doing what they can to gather food. But as the evening comes and Peter decides, you know what, I am going to go fishing. And the other disciples say, we are coming with you. And they get into his boat, the boat that uh, most likely is the same one that Jesus had preached from three years prior. And they go to fish. But once again, they fish all night and they catch nothing. For guys who are grieving and guys who are confused and for Peter who already is feeling like a failure as a disciple, I'm sure this was a tough tough night and they begin to see the light breaking over the horizon as dawn approaches and in verse four or five we hear that as they start to come to the shore there is somebody standing on the shore and it's Jesus but they don't realize it's him and he calls out to them children do you have any fish and apparently the expression here calling them children is the way that we might say lads or friends have you got any fish And they're 100 meters out or 100 yards out. So they're kind of having to shout a little over the sea. And the guys just shout back, no, we've got nothing. And then this person, this stranger on the shore says, well, cast your net on the right side of the boat. And maybe in that moment, some of them just recalled three years earlier where they had had a night of fishing where they caught nothing and somebody had told them to cast the net out again. But for whatever reason, they decide, okay, we're going to do it one last time. And they throw the net out and the net fills with fish. And maybe in a fraction of a moment, they recall that episode three years before And John certainly does because he says to Peter, it's got to be the Lord. This has got to be our Savior. He's the only one that does this. And Peter's reaction is just beautiful. We see once again his feisty and impulsive character. He had taken off his outer coat for fishing and probably just working in his uh, loincloth or like undergarment type thing. And uh, he pulls on his his tunic and he just dives into the sea. He doesn't care about the fish anymore. His savior is on the shore and he wants to be near him. And the disciple that once had jumped out of a boat when it was in the middle of the same sea to walk on the water towards his savior here jumps out and plunges in the water to to wade or swim towards the shore to see his savior. The other disciples grab hold of the net and they pull it in behind the boat. And then as they all come to the shore, they have this beautiful breakfast. As the light is breaking over the horizon, as the sun is beginning to rise, there's this charcoal fire and on it there is some fish and bread. And the interesting thing is that in John's gospel, there's only one other place, in, and it's actually in the whole of the New Testament, I think, where there is a charcoal fire mentioned. And that's actually um, in the court of the high priest where Peter had denied Jesus. And maybe as Peter walks ashore and his Savior is standing next to this charcoal fire, Peter maybe recalls the last time he saw his Savior over a charcoal fire. Maybe he recalls the fact that he has denied him so recently. But what we see here is instead of rebuking him or chastising him or saying, seriously, Peter, man, do you have the audacity to come running towards me just now? What does our Savior do? What do we see here? The creator of the universe, the one that threw stars into space, the one that spoke everything into existence, the one who condescended and and humbled himself to the point of being born in a manger and dying on a cross, has here risen and has here cooked them breakfast. 
And he says to Peter, go and grab some of the fish that you just caught, the ones that I put in your net. And Peter runs and grabs the net and hauls it in. And there's 153 large fish. And I don't think we want to get hung up on the number. Throughout history, people have done all kinds of weird maths on 153. Um, But I think the point is that Jesus filled this net with large fish way beyond um, what they would normally catch. And it's just this nice detail that we are told there was 153 of them. Somebody was so excited that they took the time to count them. So they get fish and they bring it and... Uh, here they all are around the fire and Jesus says to them, come guys, come and have breakfast. And together they sit on the shore with their master, with their creator, with their risen savior. And they watch the sunrise and they eat breakfast together and they warm themselves round a fire. You see, because Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, uh, through him, the world might be saved. And here he sits with his disciples, the ones that had scattered like sheep, the one that had denied him. And he serves them once again. The last time he served them, he had washed their feet before he broke the bread and gave it to them. And here he has filled their net and set the fire and cooked them a meal. And again, he picks up the bread and breaks it and gives it to each one of them. And this, friends, is the third time that they saw their Savior. And he is risen and he is real. He is no um, hallucination or ghost. But seven guys sat down and he cooked them breakfast and shared food with them. And then after breakfast comes the conversation that Peter was probably craving for on one hand and dreading on the other. But we see in verse 15 and 17, 15 to 17 that Jesus initiates this conversation. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Remember what Peter had said to him when he was boasting the night before his death? He said, All these other guys might desert you, but I love you so much, I am willing to die with you. And here Jesus says to him, Simon, do you love me? Do you really love me more than these guys? Peter, I'm sure, was stung by the question. I'm sure his conscience was pricked and he was convicted by it, but he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says to him, feed my sheep or feed my lambs. Peter had denied Jesus three times. And here Jesus asks him three times, Simon, do you love me? When he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It says Peter was grieved because he had asked him the third time. But the truth is that as we meet Jesus and as we come to him and he exposes our sin to us, he doesn't do it in some uh, way to just rub it in and hurt us. But equally, he doesn't just take it and um, sweep it under the rug. But instead, he takes our sin and he lays it on himself. And as we acknowledge our sin and repent of it, it stings. As we acknowledge that we are sinners, it can grieve us, it can hurt us. But friends, what a joy, what a blessing, what a delight and freedom comes through uh, the humble act of acknowledging that we are sinners before our Savior and acknowledging our love for Him. Repentance is painful as we turn away from sin, but as we turn away from the empty bitterness of sin, we turn to one who reaches out to us with outstretched arms and 
pierced hands and welcomes us as our Savior. And what's interesting is, look at how Peter responds. He says, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. I think in this moment, Peter is just acknowledging that he delights in being known by his Savior. He's saying, Jesus, you know my heart. You know that I'm a sinner. I said to you I was a sinner the first time I met you. And you know me better than I know myself. But you also know that I do love you. And once again, Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. And what's interesting here, friends, is notice that each time that Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And each time that Peter says he does, Jesus says to him, feed my sheep or feed my lambs, feed my flock. And notice what is happening here, that as we come to our Savior Jesus, if we truly love him, the way that we show our love to uh, to him isn't by becoming zealous and aggressive to defend him violently against anyone who would oppose him. It's not through um, really confidently talking about him all the time or being really eloquent. The way that we demonstrate our love to our Savior is primarily through the way that we love and serve his people. It is through the laborious task of serving one another out of love for our Savior. And that is what Jesus calls Peter to here. And the first time that uh, Jesus performed this miracle of this amazing catching of fish three years before, he had said to the disciples, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But here uh, on this occasion, Jesus isn't calling Peter to be a fisher of men, but to be an under shepherd, to shepherd his people. He's saying, if you love me, Peter, then love my flock and care for them and feed them. And then what follows in verses to 18 and, and 19 is where uh, Jesus tells Peter how he is going to die. In that moment, Peter comes full circle. Christ um, allows Peter to affirm his love three times after denying him three times. And then he tells him um, that actually that promise he made that he would be willing to die for his Savior. Jesus is saying, you will die for me. You will lay down your life in serving me and my people. And this may seem discouraging. This may seem like um, a punishment or some kind of criticism. But actually what Jesus is doing here is reassuring and affirming Peter. He's saying to Peter, I have a plan for you and you are one of my disciples. And yes, it's going to involve pain and service and struggle, but know that you are mine and know that I love you. And when you think about it, friends, that I am sure that this conversation, this um, this uh, restoring of that relationship that Peter had with Jesus. And this promise that Jesus gives him here would have been a huge strength to Peter in his final days when he was captured and led away and killed. I'm sure this conversation echoed in his ears. So what does this have to do with us? What does this teach us? Well, as Peter denied Jesus, what Peter failed to grasp was that as he disassociated himself from Jesus in that moment, just before, uh, in the night before Jesus' death, as Peter's fear and shame gripped him and he separated himself from Jesus, that actually in that moment, the Savior was associating himself with Peter and with Peter's sin. Peter disassociated himself from Jesus, but Jesus associated himself with Peter in sin and in death. You see, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Peter was a messed up sinner, but Jesus loved him and died for him, even as Peter was denying Jesus. And friends, you and I have failed Jesus, whether we know it or not. If we are not trusting in him, then we have failed him in our unbelief. And if we are Christians, then each of us can recall moments that we are ashamed of. Moments where we question, how could he love us? But friends, I want to remind you that God has demonstrated his love for you and I and for Peter and for every person listening to this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have failed our Savior, but our Savior has not failed us. And the risen Jesus here in this passage lovingly um, and uh, forgives and affirms his disciples. He meets them where they are in their messed up state and he restores them and loves them and encourages them. So friends, however messed up you maybe feel, however weak you maybe feel your faith is, however much of a failure you maybe feel as a Christian, let me assure you that you are not so far away from him that you cannot be saved. And that your salvation doesn't depend um, on your performance. Your, what saves you isn't how good you are for Jesus, but how good he is for you and how he has taken on your sin and borne it on that cross and died the death that you and I should have died and taken that wrath that God was pouring out on sin and taken it on himself so that you and I can be saved and have his righteousness put on us and that you and I could be called children of God. This is the risen Lord. This is why we celebrate Easter this morning. So come as you are to this Savior. And yes, as we do that, he is going to expose our sin to us. And it may be a difficult and painful conversation, but he does it out of love. And he calls us, as he does to Peter here, to demonstrate our love for him and to follow him. May God bless us as we do that. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the way that you have demonstrated love for us through our Savior Jesus, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a beautiful Savior. And Lord, we praise you and thank you that he has conquered death and that he is risen and that he is with you now and that you call us to follow him Lord, go with each one of us. Help us, give us the strength to turn from our sin and to turn to you, that you would grant each one of us that repentance, and that you would help us moment by moment, day by day, to follow our Savior, Jesus. And we ask these things in his glorious name. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. And may the Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace through our Savior Jesus. Amen. as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood. Thou thyself hast set me 